started a new study in the book of Ruth. And the picture kind of gives it away. Um, and Wes did a wonderful job of uh, laying the groundwork. And, you know, we, you always know when it's a good message because if you think about it during the week, it really hit home. It meant something to you. And in, in, in a couple of occasions, some of the things that Wes said, you know, came to mind. So, so we learned that these events surrounding the lives of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz took place during the times, uh, time of the judges. And we also know that this story is really a type of Christ and his relationship with the church. So I want to start this morning by reading one of the key verses in the book of Ruth. And this is in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And let thy people, and thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. So now if you're a Starvelite, if you've been coming here for any length of time or, or uh, uh, you've gone to a Starville wedding or if you've gone to a Zion wedding, you understand this verse, you've, you've seen it you, or you've heard it, um, you know, it really conveys the depth of the love that God has for the church and it's an agape love. And, you know, so I'm not going to get too much into agape love, so I'll just tell you, you know, for more on agape love and what it means, it's not a brotherly love, it's not a romantic love, but it's, it's more of a sacrificial love. And you can read more about that in, in uh, chapter 13 of Corinthians. It's kind of a mid-message commercial there. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, just to pique your interest, it's, it's about charity, which is translated in, in love. And at least I'll read verse 7. It says, love beareth all things, believeth all things, and hopeth all things, and endureth all things. So, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing that in this, in this story, in this... Um, book this morning is and then through this series hopefully you'll be recognizing those things so um, i want to start this morning by emphasizing marriage and how important it is to the lord um, so uh, let's talk about a, a, a book or a presentation so if you're writing a book typically what you would do is you would start at the beginning and you you give some very important information some groundwork some framework a foundation to build on and then, you know, at the end of the book, the author kind of concludes with revealing critically, critically important information and how everything comes together. And that's why a lot of people will say, you know, somewhere in the middle, they'll say, you know, skip to the end and, and see how things turn out. But then in the middle of a book, an author will take that framework and begin to build on it and tell us a story. And it leads to that, that culmination in the end. And, you know, it's similar in, in, in presentations and in many books. And I had a a uh, speech instructor when I was in college, and he kind of summed it up that, this way. He said, you, be, be, you begin by telling them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So it's constantly rehearsing and driving home a point in what is important. So if I can be so bold this morning, I, I would suggest to you that the Bible is kind of written that same way, and it's very effective. The Lord begins to telling us in Genesis about marriage. And Abraham said, and this is Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So this is the beginning. This is important information. And then if you skip to the end, it says, you know, it, it's about the marriage of the Lamb, and that whole culmination and getting ready for that moment. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and the wife hath made herself ready, and his wife has made herself ready. And then what's in the middle? So you got the beginning and you got the end. It talks about marriage. Well, in the middle, if you can boil it down to just a couple sentences or a couple thoughts, it's about getting ready for that day you know, for that marriage supper. And we have all these books in the, in the Bible. You know, we have parables that talk about the ten virgins. We have the Song of Solomon, which describes, you know, in poetry form, the relationship between God and his Savior, between the people and the Savior. We, we have Proverbs that give us practical uh, application. We've got um, epistles that tell us how to live together in unity. Every single chapter points to Christ and us getting re ready to meet him. It's, the book of Ruth is really a love story. You know, and it says in John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for God, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And he that loveth knoweth not, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 
In this was manifested the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into this world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, saying all that, and a lot of this we understand, um, marriage is important in the eyes of heaven. God established it. It's important to him. He begins and he ends with marriage. So, why has it been so dismissed? You know, the world says, oh, marriage, we'll try it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. And then we'll quit and we'll do something else if it doesn't work out. You know, some people two, three, four times. The problem is that has kind of crept into the church. And the church has forgotten about the importance in how heaven views marriage. And if you look at the book and how it's written and what it's about, it should reinforce, um, it, it should reinforce that um, it's not a contract, it's not a passing agreement, but it's a vow and it carries weight and importance in heaven. So as I was beginning this message, I kind of thought, well, that's my pre-sermon. If any of you remember Pastor Tucker, Pastor Dad, when he was here, sometimes he would do a pre-sermon and then he would do a sermon. So that's my little mini starting sermon about the importance of marriage. Now, the rest of it, I want to kind of downshift and, and make a left-hand turn on you here a little bit. And I want to talk about Ruth and Naomi and this idea of um, uh, being alone. They suffered great loss and they found themselves um, you would almost think or feel like they, they, they were abandoned. They lost, you know, Naomi lost it all, her sons, her husband. Um, so it's a, it's a book about loss and loneliness, but that's at the beginning. Now, the end of Ruth has a glorious ending. And, uh, and I mentioned last week how nice it is to have the book of Ruth show up right after the Pentateuch. You know, you go back to the beginning of the year and you start reading the Bible. And you read about the law and you read about numbers and you read about genealogies and it, and it, can, it can get pretty tough. So then the, uh, right after that, this love story kind of emerges, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of nice. And I, I love sometimes, I'll, I'll tell you a secret, sometimes I'll watch YouTube videos of the endings of my favorite movies. Have you ever done that? I don't have time or the inclination to watch the entire thing but the last five minutes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a feel-good thing, right? <laughs> I don't need to watch the whole thing and watch the last five minutes because it's so cool. But the reason it's so cool to watch the happy ending is because we, we at some point know and have witnessed and seen the characters going through something very, very difficult. And that's what makes it so cool. So when they emerge from the other side, we're like, yes! You know, we see that ending, and it's a glorious ending. And uh, Ruth and Naomi suffered. And uh, they couldn't just skip to the end of the book and see how it all works out. So these women understood separation, loss of loved ones, loneliness, and despair. And Ruth says this in chapter 1, Verse 20, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again, empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So there's no way that you can appreciate the glorious end of this book and how everything worked out and the Lord brought glory to his name without understanding what these two women went through. Um, you know, so to have a glorious end, Sometimes there's some difficulty in the middle. You know, and that's one of the reasons I have difficulty with, you know, the, the, the prosperity doctrine because, you know, come to Jesus and he'll take care of all your troubles and he'll give you everything that you ask for. Well, there's some truth to that. Um, the Lord wants to um, give us the desires of our heart. We even heard that in prophecy this morning. And he also wants to cure those things. He wants to cure our ills. But it's a process. It's a process. And... It's a process that kind of requires us going through a valley and sometimes a lonely place. But that's where we find Christ. And that's where we identify with his death and burial. But it's not just a death and burial, right? We can skip to the end of the story and we can see the end of the story is resurrection. And we talk about these things this morning. And I, and I won't kid you, it's not one of those um, hallelujah glory messages. We're talking about loneliness here. Uh, I don't want to bum you out or anything. But I can tell you this, that even though we're going through difficulty, the Bible says, um, well, G, well, Scripture says we, we don't have to be afraid. Yes, we're going through this, but we don't have to be afraid. A very familiar verse in Psalm chapter 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I, walk, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. So it doesn't say we'll never see evil. It doesn't say that we won't experience it. We won't be touched by it in some way. 
but it does say that we don't have to fear it. And I really appreciate the, the uh, verse that Pastor Rob gave us this year to kind of start the new year. To, he gives us a theme and a verse that the Lord lays in his heart. And the verse was this in Luke chapter 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for, your fa- for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We don't have to have fear. So I want to talk about this idea of blame. So a couple notable things. Uh, one of the notable things about these two women is you never hear them complain. You know, even though they were left alone, they lost her husband. Naomi lost her children. When you read Naomi's response, you know, she's, she's pretty low, and she kind of bemoans her estate, um, but she never shakes a fist at God. Um, it's kind of human nature for us to look for someone to lay blame on when things get bad. And I don't know, maybe you've done it. I know that, uh, you know, hopefully you've never cursed God, or hopefully you've never shaken your fist at God, but you may or may not have done this. What are you doing? You know, questioned and asked. You know, that subtle um, murmuring and complaining. So um, this past week, there were a few of us that were unhappy about a task that was given to us, some thing that we had to do. And, uh, you know, I had to do something on my day off, and don't mess with me on my day off. But <laughs> one thing I can assure you is when a higher-ranking officer says he wants something done, you know, it's, yes, sir, you, you go and do it. Um, and uh, you don't complain to that officer. You don't, compl- you don't go complain to a colonel or a general, but he's got these e- e- executive officers that uh, do his bidding, so we get on the phone with him, and what's going on, why is this, you know, so, because I need someone to blame, and I can't go, you know, bark at the colonel, that's just not going to happen, um, you know, because we look for that easy target, and, uh, you know, he, the executive officer, he just listened to me, and he's like, yeah, and then I said, hey, thanks for letting me vent, you know, I know it's not your fault, <laughs> and he said, hey, it's my job, so he does his job good, um, so Job, he, he complained. He, 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 he left the Lord as, as a target. He said, therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. This is Job chapter 7, verse 11. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And I think about my own tendencies. You know, you know it's, it's easy to ask questions and ask God, why? Why have, you left, why have you done this? Why have you left me in this lonely and dark place? We can begin to feel sorry for us and wonder if he even sees us in what's going on, but we need to remember that it could very well be at this precise time that, you know, we meet God in some extraordinary way, and we find those treasures in darkness and hidden riches in secret places that we may never have otherwise been able to get our hands on. So when Jacob went to meet his brother, um, he was afraid for his life. Now, fortunately, we go through things, we struggle, we suffer through things, but we don't, we don't typically worry about our lives, do we? In, in the United States, you know, we go through our day pretty much without worrying about being attacked and being killed. <laughs> but, you know, this was something that Jacob, you know, he had good reason to be afraid of his brother. He made some very bad moves, some ill-advised moves, uh, some very deceitful things that he did to his brother, and those things were coming home to roost. And... Um, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 6, and the, the messengers that Jacob sent returned to Jacob and said, We came to thy brother Esau, and he also cometh to meet thee, and 400 men with thee. And D- Jacob, at this point, did what he was used to doing. He made a plan to try to figure a way to get him out of the situation that, you know, God had got him in. Um, it's kind of how Jacob rolled. Um, you know, when Laban uh, cheated him, he came up with a plan, though, that crazy idea where he took those sticks and he peeled the bark off and he put them in the trough and <laughs> what is that even about what why? you know jacob he's a he's a planner and a bit of a schemer um you know i, I can remember this prompted a thought of a, a program manager that i worked with years ago and we i called him and he came and there was a problem and he was looking at the problem and i was standing behind him and uh, i could hear him talking to himself under his breath what do i do what do i do what do i do what do i do and I, I can kind of imagine, you know, Jacob doing that. His brother's coming to kill him, and he's just, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? You know, he was thinking about how he gets, and once again, he devises a plan. So Genesis chapter 32, um, verse 22, that same night he took, and he rose and took his two wives, two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. In verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. And at some point in our lives, you know, we're probably going to find ourselves alone and there's not going to be someone there to help us. All right, it's not going to be our pastor. It's not going to be our parents, our spouse, or family, or children. He will allow that at times in our lives to find ourselves in a lonely place. And he does that for a specific purpose. And for Jacob's purpose, 
it was so that he could um, get a grip, or he, that he could, uh, you know, recognize the magnitude of his, his situation, and it compelled him to get a hold of and to find his God. And we read there in these verses that a man met him, and uh, we never get the name of the person who met him, but Jacob kind of gives it away. He says, I've seen, the face, uh, uh, I've seen God face to face and survived it. So it was the Lord who met him there in that place when he was alone. And the rest of uh, Genesis 32, 22 says, a man wrestled him, with him until the break of day. And we might find ourselves in a very dark and lonely place and in a wrestling match with God. And, uh, you know, maybe not a physical wrestling match like it was for Jacob, but certainly in our mind and in our spirit, we can get into a wrestling match with God. And fortunately, the Lord, you know, he takes it easy on us. He goes lightly on us when he's wrestling with us. <laughs> I can remember wrestling with my kids uh, when they were little, and I would have to take it easy on them. I couldn't just, you know, body slam them like WrestleMania. I kind of had to be gentle, and I just, I can imagine the Lord and his mercy. That's how he deals with us, and that's how he dealt with, with Jacob. You know, you know, but, you know, as time went on, um, you know, I, wrestling with my kids, things have changed a little bit. Now, you know, Mitch has to take it easy on his, on his old dad, and even Catherine can take me. I get, I get winded pretty easily, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, think about this situation with Jacob for a minute. He got himself into this mess, and he tried to come up with a plan to get, him, to get himself out of it, but God still had mercy on him. Um, how do we respond? Oh, you get what you deserve, you know, um, but God allowing this to happen, for him to be left alone there, um, there was no one left to look at but himself, and have you ever gotten in that situation where you're all alone, and there's no one left to look at but yourself, and it can be pretty unpleasant at times. Um, it forces us to face some things. And God knew that Jacob being alone was going to be the only way that he was going to um, be able to change him. And of course, Jacob didn't come away from that situation entirely unscathed. He ended up getting a permanent injury, and that was to remind him who he was dealing with. Let me go forth, for the day breaketh. Genesis chapter 32, verse 26. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And you know, with Naomi and Ruth, they were left alone. But in their story as well, the conclusion of this solitary journey they were on, the end result is God made a name for them as well. And if you think about it, um, so we talked about skipping to the end of the book. So let's do that now. Let's go ahead and let's, let's skip to the end of the book and see how it, how it works out. So spoiler alert, Boaz and Ruth do get together and they get married. In case you, I think everybody's probably read the book of Ruth at one point. So the book ends by telling us about the names and the names of uh, the son and the grandson. And names are important, right? And God wants to give you and I a new name. And we read this in Ruth chapter 14, verse 7. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, and he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So that's a pretty glorious end. And I think about you know, the New Testament, and when we start in Matthew, what does Matthew do? First thing he does is he establishes a kingly line of Jesus by telling us that Ruth's children and grandchildren were ancestors to Christ. That's really a glorious result of everything that they went through. So I have a, a cousin who's really interested in um, family genealogies, family trees, and he's worked it for years. So my cousin came over and we were going through genealogies. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun looking at family history and who's who and looking at old pictures because he's got a ton of stuff. Um, but nothing can be cooler than finding out that you are related to the King of Kings and seeing that in your history and your lineage and your genealogy. So I want to talk about discouragement because being alone, being in a place where you may feel abandoned in a dark place, you know, you can get kind of discouraged. And most of us have probably heard that one of the most powerful weapons in Satan's arsenal is, this, this, uh, is using discouragement against us. And because it's, you know, it's, it's so effective, it robs us of hope. You know, Ruth and Naomi were left alone and, um, you know, she starts talking like she doesn't have hope. She tells Ruth to go home and says, there are no more sons in my womb, even if there were. Even if I got married tonight, would you, would you wait around? So, it, you know, she pretty much is saying, hey, it's over. And this sounds pretty hopeless. In Ruth chapter 12, 1 and verse 12, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, 
if I should have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you tarry for them to be grown? Would you stay for them? Um, for it grieveth me much that for your sakes the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So it sounds like Naomi's giving up and she's kind of telling her daughters to give up. And one does, but the other one doesn't. Ruth does not. And for, fortunately, we serve a God who is full of hope and wants to give us hope. And, you know, Ruth doesn't go back. And it doesn't, it really, in some ways, it doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense because why wouldn't you go home where you know people? You know, it's bad enough you've lost your husband and you're, you're, you're left alone, but now you're going to a land where nobody knows you. It's almost like Ruth was making a, a, a bad situation worse. At least with her own people, she wouldn't be alone. Um, now she's going to go to a strange land. She's going to be surrounded by people, but she's not going to know anybody and, and how lonely a place. And you know, we can be alone and be surrounded by people. That can even happen in the church, and it often does happen in the church. Um, and, uh, you know, we can be surrounded by people, but, yeah, that sense of loneliness. So that's why it's important to look out for each other. We had a little bit this morning in the pre-service about being a family, which I appreciate because we are a family, and it's important that we're sensitive to each other and, and look out for those that might be separated off or distancing themselves or, or maybe hanging out on the fringes and going out and, and reaching out to those people because um, it's a dangerous place to be because that's where the enemy is. That's where, that's where um, the wolves are at, and they'll come after the sheep. So why did Ruth make this choice? By all accounts, a very hard choice. And um, the only conclusion I can come to as I was thinking about this is that she saw some reflection of the living God in Naomi. So she knew about the gods of her own people and not impressed. Um, she knew there was nothing there. But on the other hand, she saw something different in Naomi. Even though Naomi um, said that God is against me, you know, why would you want to go serve a God who's against his people? So she says, God is against me, and she was discouraged. But still, there was something there that Ruth wanted that she saw in the life of Naomi, so much so that she began to trust God. And this is what Boaz tells her at one point, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given of thee, of the Lord thy God, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And that's Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. So as we as we um, wind toward conclusion here, I would ask you a question. Are you in a place, a similar place, where it feels very alone, a, an impossible situation, maybe feeling pretty hopeless? Can you still trust the Lord? That's not an easy question to answer. Are you in a place where you feel alone, maybe disconnected, surrounded by people, but um, trust the Lord? So, discouragement. Some of the most Spiritual people in the Bible, in Scripture, have gone through this discouragement. You are not alone. Don't think you are alone when you're going through discouragement. Peter said, I go fishing. He go, it, does it sound like he's giving up? You know, he went through everything he went through, but now I'm just going to go back to my day job. I don't know what all that was about. Yeah, it was cool, it was fun, nice memory. So how could this happen? You know, Peter spending years with Jesus, hearing him every day, still became discouraged and said, I'm going fishing. David was left alone in the wilderness. And he kind of at one point says, you know, what's the use? Saul's going to eventually find me and kill me. David, you know, he's done nothing wrong. And that, that's hard. Um, <laughs> you know, you've done everything right. You ever had that situation in life? Do it all right. And then congratulations. Now you've got to go run for your life because somebody's going to try to kill you because you did everything right. And in a spiritual sense, you know, sometimes that happens. David said in his heart in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, I shall now perish. I'm going to die by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me to do than I should speedily escape into the land of Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his end. That's David making a little bit of a plan on his own, just kind of like Jacob did, kind of like Naomi and her husband did. You know, famine in the land is the reason they left. So things are getting pretty bad here. Let's, let's go somewhere else. So we want to be careful if the Lord is bringing us through something. He will give us grace to get through it and not jump ship because it's easy to go out of the frying pan and right into the fire. Um, so, you know, David rejected, exiled by himself, did nothing wrong, but he's running for his life. And another one is Elijah. 
Elijah. You know, the Lord, he says to the Lord as he goes into the wilderness, this is right after he was dealing with Jezebel and the prophets of Baal, and the Lord did tremendous, miraculous stuff in his behalf. But then he says, Lord, just take me. He just, he just gives up. No hope. He's discouraged. So these people, Peter and Elijah and David, they gained, became discouraged. So don't think it's strange in your own situation when you become discouraged. You know, Elijah, he ran off to the wilderness, and the Lord comes to him and says, what are you doing here? And he begins to speak to him. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14, this is Elijah answering the Lord, and he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Again, did everything right. The Lord did miraculous stuff in his behalf, and he's running for his life. <laughs> sounds like that's you know that's that's when you graduation that's your graduation present <laughs> you know you went through the class you passed the test you graduated and now your graduation present is you get to run for your life you know sometimes that happens but when we're feeling alone and we feel like we might be in a hopeless case we're really not we're not we're not alone we have to learn to trust the lord and let um, patience have her perfect work so what i want to do in conclusion here is read a psalm, Psalm 63. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I really want to, but I don't think I'm going to have time. Um, so, homework assignment, um, go read the chapter about love in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and also read Psalm 63. Read it a couple times. It's short. Man, it will encourage you. Now, tradition holds, and as I research this a little bit, that Psalm 63 was likely written by David when he was in the wilderness, when he was by himself, when he was running for his life. And David could get a little melancholy too, you know, Job did, Naomi did, you know, where we get a little woe is me. Um, but this, this chapter, chapter 63, is a little bit different. So he doesn't do that in this verse. He doesn't say, you know, everyone's out to get me. You know those psalms you've read, oh, you know, I'm surrounded, the water's, you know, overtaking me, I'm watering my couch with tears. You know, David could get that way, he could get a little... He could get a little blue and they could come through in his, in his psalms. But this is different. He was going through the wilderness. And this chapter, chapter 63, is different. And this is how we need to respond when we find ourselves alone. And it seems like we have been abandoned. And, you know, we, we look up and we don't hear anything from heaven. And we look around and there's no one to talk to or ask questions or, or get counsel from. So, Psalm 63 Verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee, while I live, I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Hey Amen. Let's all stand together. If you are alone, or if you're feeling alone, um, one of the things I remember from last week is a word Wes used, the word orchestrated. The Lord may have orchestrated some things for you, and it's not because he's cruel. It's not. It's, it's because he wants to do for you what he did for Jacob. I need to get him into this situation. So he turns to me. He has no other direction to turn but to me. And then I can give him the answer that he's looking for. The Lord wants to give you the desires of your heart. But he's going to arrange some circumstances where you're going to get a hold of him. And you're going to wrestle with him. And you're going to lose. <laughs> but the end of the story is that he's going to change your name. And that we can become related. <laughs> you know, we can become married um, to the Savior. And we can be part of that marriage supper, which is... How, um, how the Bible ends in Revelation. So hopefully that encourages you. I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to talk about things like loneliness and you know, some of the scriptures would kind of just you know, make you um, a, maybe a little bit blue, but the end of the story is life. Death, burial, and resurrection. Death and burial, but there's also, revelation, uh, there's also uh, resurrection. There's life in the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.
I appreciated considering all.